Good morning. Thanks very much, Chris. Okay, so I'm just going to touch on some support that's available through Local Energy Scotland, as, as, as Chris mentioned, and then perhaps touch on some of the, you know, the, the policy uh, and subsidy issues um, that are prevalent at the moment uh, as well. Just a wee bit about Local Energy Scotland and, and who we are as well. We're a consortium uh, organisation uh, built from five regional uh, partners. Um, we have um, Changeworks in, in this area as a regional partner and a variety of other ones spaced across the, the, the country. We also have technical support from our consultant Chicago AEA. Uh, basically, Local Energy Scotland uh, was developed to manage the Scottish Government's CARE scheme, so that's the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. And this was set up by the, the Scottish Government uh, to help attain uh, the 500 megawatts of community and locally owned energy uh, by 2020. Uh, as well. So we deliver the, the CARES programme on behalf of the, the Scottish Government. So what do we do? The whole reason for CARES, for Local Energy Scotland, is really to try and increase uh, the local benefit from uh, community energy, from renewable energy uh, indeed as well. And we are there to provide advice and support uh, at each stage uh, of a project development, whether it be a community benefit project, a shared ownership project, or, or indeed a, a community self-developed project uh, as well. We have a, a network of uh, local development officers across the country. I think there's around uh, eight of us. Uh, I've been covering uh, Argyle for the, for the last year while my colleague Iona has been away on maternity leave. So she's back with us uh, on a full-time basis uh, in the next few weeks uh, as well. So that's, that's great and there'll be continuing support for the Argyle area uh, through her. The types of organisations, it's, it's quite varied. Um, so we can support you know, communities, uh, rural businesses, uh, we treat rural businesses as locally owned uh, as well. Um, <coughs> we also support local authorities, housing associations, charities, third sector organisations there as well. And there's all a route for these organisations through CARES. So just a wee bit more on what CARES, CARES does. We're generally involved in projects on kind of three different levels. Um, we can assist communities uh, with, with community benefit from uh, externally owned uh, projects. We have kind of, kind of grant funding that can assist communities getting themselves set up uh, and governance. We have things like a, a community benefit guidance package uh, where if communities are presented with an opportunity for funds perhaps from a, a large wind farm uh, for instance, uh, there's guidance there and obviously advice through the development officers to help you go through that process and uh, eventually to you know, fund distribution uh, there as well. So there's support available um, through that. Um, also very much involved in, in shared ownership and at Argyle there's quite a lot of these kind of projects uh, coming along at, at, at the moment. It's not legislated for but there's a general understanding from uh, developers to offer a shared ownership opportunity to communities and there's a number of initiatives in Argyle at the moment where uh, communities are, are coming together uh, in a kind of consortium approach uh, in order to engage with the developers and of course be representative of that, that wider uh, community. We have, we have one in, in South Kintyre under development and one in Mid Argyle uh, at, at the moment so hopefully that's a good platform for communities to come and, uh, and engage with these uh, larger uh, developments uh, for any community opportunities that may, may, may arise. Um, Obviously, at the top of the pyramid there, we have 100% you know, community-owned uh, renewable energy installations as well. And I, I think it was mentioned before, the community benefit. Okay, that's great, fair enough. But uh, you know, if it's 100% owned, then you know, any you know, net revenues or, or, or profits as such will go back into the, to the local community. So this is really the, the pinnacle. But of course, with these developments, and I'm sure we'll hear some of the, the challenges that the projects have faced um, uh, as we go through, through the day, there is an absolute increasing risk and responsibility and commitment required by communities you know, to, to undertake a 100% locally owned renewable energy project. But just to you know, reassure, there's a uh, support, like I say, through ourselves, as Audrey's uh, outlined the support available through uh, the council, and we are absolutely there, open for business to help you develop the project through those stages. So just a wee bit more on the, the, the specific support that's available uh, through Local Energy Scotland and indeed the, the, the CARES programme. In order to kind of support, support communities, we can be there from the, from the very start, you know, to discuss ideas with you and give you advice and support. We can network you with other communities that have perhaps been through uh, the same journey so we can, you know, foster knowledge sharing 
uh, within communities and, and between communities here as well. In order to facilitate you know, this kind of early stage work, we have uh, an initial grant available to communities of up to £10,000. And this can be used for things like uh, um, setting up an organisation, constituting an organisation, uh, community consultation, but generally most of used for things like early feasibility studies. Um, so you can, um, you know, you can assess a, a local resource to see if you know, it would be suitable for renewable energy developments. Uh, there as well. We have other assistance um, through that. We have things like uh, framework contractors and tender templates, these sorts of things as well to assist communities in procuring the advice and the consultants that you require to undertake, uh, for instance, a, a feasibility study as well. If a, a feasibility <coughs> study looks, looks fruitful and you know, there's an opportunity uh, there, uh, then we then offer, we can offer uh, groups uh, early development loans up to uh, 150k. This has an intrinsic right of facility built into it as well. It was designed, you know, I think the Scottish Government's aware that these projects can, can be quite risky uh, as well, but certainly keen to see them uh, developed. So we have this right of facility. Really, you know, if projects reach, uh, you know, an insurmountable obstacle, uh, then, you know, any funds drawn down to that stage can, can be written off or essentially turned into to, to grants. Uh, there as well. So I've been on kind of shared ownership. I mentioned that we're, we're keen to support those types of uh, developments. There's been a number of successful ones in uh, Argyll and we're looking forward to hearing from uh, Tarbert Skip Ness and uh, Tyler yeah. Bruch who um, were involved in a, a wind farm shared ownership opportunity just up the road behind us there as well. For these purposes for communities we actually increased the grants amount to, to 20 grand. <coughs> We wouldn't expect generally any feasibility to work uh, work to be carried out using that that fund. It's generally to procure expert advice in order to appraise uh, you know, investment opportunities, these types of things as well. So we do have a framework of contractors on our website with um, uh, you know financial advisors, legal advisors, project managers that, that groups can procure using our grants uh, in order to you know bring in those services and enable you to appraise opportunities that, that come along. Um, and it's indicated there in the professional advice on our, our frameworks. The loan can be used if it's a shared ownership project and you know, communities are going you know, half and half with developers uh, there as well. There is a loan available at that point as well to contribute towards those, uh, you know, let's say 50% if that's the case, of the, the development costs of that project as well. Um, I'll touch on this uh, just, just briefly. Um, um, I think I heard already mentioned community benefits uh, the last time this uh, took place. We're certainly there to keem to support that as well. And at Local Energy Scotland, uh, we host the Scottish Government's register of community benefits, so you can have a look on there, um, see you know, which you know, developers, what their contribution it has been, and indeed a list of communities who have been in receipt of community benefit, and you can have a look at what they've done you know, with those funds and how it's assisted in you know, transforming their uh, communities as well. We, the Scottish Government has also uh, developed good practice principles for uh, community benefits, uh, recommending uh, a figure of at least £5,000 per, per megawatt. Um, um, that's not legislated for, but it's a, a, you know, a memorandum of understanding with developers, and that seems to be the case in my experience. Most of them are you know, um, towing the line as such and offering this kind of 5k. Um, uh, community benefits as well. But of course, as mentioned previously, we, we do have a raft of support available for communities to engage with developers in relation to community benefits uh, as well. And I was just having a look at some of the numbers just uh, uh, the other day in preparing uh, these slides. It's absolutely amazing to see almost £10 million uh, in Scotland um, in a year per year, uh, that is, uh, from community benefit funds. So we're certainly helping to, to transform uh, local communities. Just a wee bit, you know, on some of the projects that we've assisted, you know, in, in developing. Probably uh, the, the most recent uh, kind of success story for communities is uh, uh, the community in Point Sandwick up in the, uh, the Western Isles. It's probably the, the largest project, certainly, I'm aware of that we've kind of dealt with. So nine megawatts, fairly, fairly substantial development um, uh, there uh, as well. And that's wholly owned by the, the Development Trust um, uh, there uh, as well. Um, all the revenue is going to come, come to them, and, and you know the size of this, and, and, you, and you see there the figure of you know kind of a million pounds a year um, net returns to the community over 25 years. So I'd expect that development to be you know transformative, certainly uh, for, for for that area as well. 
And just an idea, we can share ownership and working in partnership uh, as well. This is a, a development student energy, and I do believe that this is actually going live uh, this week, uh, this project um, as well. So it's great to see shared ownership projects coming through. So I think it would be remiss to come today and not have you know a, a bit of an indication about some of the policy changes and suggestions uh, that are, are prevalent at the moment uh, as well. And since the change in, in, in the UK government, then they've proposed a set of measures to control uh, the costs under the, the feed-in tariff, which is of course the main subsidy um, you know, the community energy projects are, are developed uh, under there as well. They have brought out a number of, of consultations uh, regarding this at the moment. There's one which is now, now closed, but uh, under consideration from the UK government, and this was the idea of removing uh, pre-accreditation uh, from the feed-in tariff as well. So pre-accreditation is the ability for a community scheme to lock in at today's feed-in tariff uh, and still get that tariff a couple of years in the future, let's say, for hydro. Um, so it gives them a wee bit of surety. So, but there are proposals to kind of remove that as a cost control measure. Um, we have responded to that at Local Energy Scotland, so hopefully we can maybe hear towards the end of this month uh, the outcome of that. Um, there's also a consultation out just now on a, a full review of the feed and tariff uh, system as well, and that's certainly still open uh, at the moment to that one. Just to touch a wee bit more on the, the removal of pre-accreditation, really uh, the government has, the UK government has, has brought this out to try and you know, limit the risk to uh, bill payers um, through, through the burden of you know, the feed and tariff costs there as well. Now, obviously if this, if the worst case scenario, if this does come to fruition, uh, I think it, because communities will be unable to guarantee a revenue at some point in the future, because the tariff does come down slightly, um, you know, over over a time period there as well, it will be quite difficult for communities to, let's say, go to a bank and say, "This is the exact revenue that I'm going to get." So, if, if banks view things a wee bit more kind of riskier, they make the cost of finance that a wee bit more expensive as well. But I think what could happen with this, if it does come to fruition, you know, there will be certainly more novel ways of community raising finance uh, for these things as well, whether it's locally raised. Uh, kind of money or whether you know uh, other organizations can come in and you know with, with let's say lower cost kind of finance and still make these projects financially viable and there was a, a distinct nod to communities we'll see how this one one goes but um it certainly mentioned in the, the consultation <coughs> itself that there may be a case for reintroducing pre-accreditation specifically for community groups so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that towards the, the end of the month as we believe possibly the other consultation that's out at the moment is a, like I say, a full review of, of, of the feed and tariff scheme uh, as well. There's a, a number of different measures uh, within that document, and I encourage everybody to have a wee look of that if, if, if you're interested, and certainly encourage uh, people to respond uh, to that uh, however they, they, they see fit. Uh, a number of things, more stringent digression, that's the way that the feed and tariff comes down over time, linked to the number of installations that are being accredited. But interesting to see in that there as well another nod uh, in, the, in the fine print as such you know towards community groups um, as well and it's mentioned in there you know that there's a possibility of, of retaining support specifically for community groups uh, as well. So like I say that consultation is open at the moment and uh, I would certainly encourage uh, if interested and motivated to uh, respond to that there as well. So what does this really mean for you know impacts for the future uh, and, and the way that, uh, that you know the community energy is going to move uh, in, the, in, in the future. Now, everything's a wee bit up in the air with these consultations, and uh, we're hopeful, you know, that um, decisions get made and, and things kind of clear up in the situation. You know, like I say, there's clarity on the situation. Hopefully, within the next uh, few months uh, there as well, there is a, a clear commitment from the Scottish government uh, in relation to, to community energy. And uh, um, just last week, they had recently published. A, 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 uh, the community energy policy statement, which gives a clear commitment uh, to communities from the Scottish Government, so it's actually part of Scottish Government policy, you know, independent of anything else that's going to happen, and so great to see that. I think I've mentioned as well, you know, with the challenges uh, through funding, we may see the, that change a wee bit in, in the future as well, such as the rise of, of community co-ops, things like the return of grants back to community energy, of course they were kind of fell by the wayside because they were incompatible with the feed-in tariff. If, if, if there's changes to the feed-in tariff, it may lead to perhaps different ways of funding community energy projects as well. And of course, in a subsidy-free environment, we may find the cost of the technology is driven down through that 
as well. And again, people were probably aware that you know there's significant challenges over overcoming you know grid constraints uh, there as well. And I think we will find that you know in the face of these possible changes to the feed-in tariff that you know let's see more marginal projects might not progress, and that may indeed release some grid capacity uh, in the area moving forward. You know, and allow you know, good solid community projects to to progress. And this whole idea of linking global energy supply and demand, which is prevalent in the Scottish Government's community energy policy statement uh, there as well, so ideas of moving forward, you know, block purchasing of local community generated electricity by local communities. So I think there'll be a number of initiatives going to come forward uh, through that uh, as well. So that's basically just uh, setting the scene. As, uh, as I think Chris had mentioned, uh, myself and, and my colleague development officers will be available today. So if anybody wants to have a wee discussion you know, about that, then we're absolutely available here today. Thank you very much.